Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Also, look us up on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. You know, first thoughts on Miguel Cotto against Daniel Gill. Uh, now, let me point out, styles make fights. But I do feel Cotto would have some success against some other guys at middleweight. But let's talk about these two guys for a second. My first take is that Daniel Gill's a live underdog. Right, I believe the smart money is going to be on Gill to win the fight, hedged with Cotto by KO. Now what I want you to do is just close your eyes for a moment. And just ask yourself, who has Miguel Cotto fought at middleweight? Right, just think about that question. Right, now as you scratch your head and as you think hard about who Cotto has fought at middleweight, just understand Daniel Gill went to Germany and fought Sebastian Sylvester, beat him. Went to Germany, fought Felix Stern, beat him, right? Fought Anthony Mundine twice. The first fight is close. He beats Mundine in the rematch. Understand how Daniel Gill loses his title. He fights Darren Barker. Dare I say, in my opinion, that's the best night of Barker's career. And even on Barker's best night, Daniel Gill hits Barker with a body shot and drops him. Right? The fight is close. They took the belt from the champion. After a fight in which the champion got the only knockdown. My point to you is if I ask you who's the real middleweight in this fight, I can tell you how I would answer that question. I would say the, meal, the real middleweight is Daniel Gill, right? He's the guy with, quite frankly, the more extensive experience at middleweight. His last fight was against Jared Fletcher. If you want to watch the fight, I've posted the video in my favorites here on YouTube. Right now, understand, Jared Fletcher, decorated amateur. He won the gold medal at the, I believe it's 2006 Commonwealth Games. Right? Fletcher starts fast. This is the fight Gill has after his car crash against Janady Golovkin. Right? Gill comes out, looks sluggish. Gill slowly takes over that fight. In the fifth round, Daniel Gill shows you why he's world class. He hits Fletcher with a great body shot. The action continues, right? Then he comes up top, hits Fletcher with a great right hand. Fletcher goes down. It's not the first good right hand. Gill hits him with that round, right? Fletcher is cursing at himself when he's on the canvas, right? He's been decked. Now here's the kicker. Understand, Gill, who's landing some crisp, clean punches, both down low and up top, had sparred with Fletcher hundreds of times, right before their head-to-head -head matchup. Yet, even in the real fight, Daniel Gill was able to land crisp punches, right? He has a multiplicity of punches. He's a guy who I call a hoverer. Right? He likes to stay just on the outskirts of the pocket. Right? He's a master at it. Here's the kicker against Cotto, who's shorter, who has a shorter reach. Right? Understand that Gill can throw power punches low. It's a body shot that takes down Darren Barker. Right? Gill's a master body puncher. Right? Gill also is able to fight at an angle. His body's hard to find. He's also excellent. He's crisp. 
throwing uppercuts with both hands. If Koto comes in and tries to fight low, let's just say that Gil is going to be prepared for him. Right? Let's back up a second. Let's talk about the Gennady Golovkin fight. Now, could you imagine watching a baseball game where they suddenly went into extra innings for no apparent reason? Right? Could you imagine watching a basketball game where at the end of 48 minutes they suddenly started going to 49 minutes, 50 minutes for no apparent reason? Right? It's only in boxing that you could have first rounds. Like the Golovkin Gill first round. Now keep in mind, Golovkin's a stalker. Gill is a little bit more complicated. He's a hoverer. Right? You know, with Gill, you don't know if he's back foot or front foot. Because he's hovering and he can pivot and throw punches wherever he is. Right? This is a little bit different than what I call a switch. Right? Gill has an inside game. But as you're fighting him, you don't know what he's doing, right? He's there, he's hovering around. You run in, sometimes he might back away, other times he might just turn. Suddenly he's there with you. Now understand, the first round of the golovkin Gill fight curiously goes not three minutes, it goes four minutes. I wish I were making this stuff up. You're talking about a fight in a big arena that was televised on HBO and somehow they got a timekeeper who couldn't keep time. It was outrageous. A lot's wrong in that fight. Understand that Golovkin's a slow starter. So Golovkin comes out in the first round and he's trying to hunt Gil down. Let's just say he had more time to do so than was allowed. Now, I'll agree. Golovkin seems to break Gil in that second round. Right then, of course, we get the knockdown. Gil looks like he's on his back foot against Golovkin. And Golovkin, of course, eventually closes the show. I believe it's in round three. Right? You want to look at the tape yourself. Understand, Golovkin is different than Miguel Cotto, right? First, can we agree that Golovkin hits hard, very hard, with both hands? In other words, I can't, against Golovkin, look at his left hand and know that I am looking at 90% of his power, right? He'll pulverize me with his right hand. Let me say this too, Golovkin's interesting because he's really a cautious stalker. Let's coin as many terms as we can, right? He's not jumping inside on you. Rather, he's slowly cutting off the ring, right? He's pursuing you, but he's taking his time with it. Now, in my opinion, that's different than Miguel Cotto. Now, let me say this. Cotto's experience in middleweight, extremely limited, right? He fought and beat Sergio Martinez. I'll concede that I had Martinez in that fight. Let me say this. Martinez looked like he had major knee problems in that fight. Right, an argument can be made that that 12th round of the Chavez-Martinez fight negatively impacted the rest of Martinez's career. His knee looks like it's locking up on him. Martinez wasn't able to be mobile like Sergio Martinez usually is able to be mobile. Right? He gets hit with, of course, Cotto's left hand. Right? Martinez looked like he couldn't get out of the way of Cotto's punches. But make no mistake, Cotto, in my opinion, is one-handed. Right? One of the reasons why 
I believe he's with Freddie Roach. And this is a recent development, right? Think the Delvin Rodriguez fight. Think the Sergio Martinez fight. It's because Freddie Roach has had great success with another one-handed fighter, Manny Pacquiao. Right now, Cotto was able to deliver against Martinez, who's a southpaw. Understand, Cotto himself is a southpaw fighting out of an inverted stance. Right, so he was able to against a less than a hundred percent Sergio Martinez. Right, this isn't the Martinez who fights the first eleven rounds of the Chavez fight. This is post 12th round of Chavez, Sergio Martinez. Right? Cotto's able to have much more movement than Martinez, much more movement than Cotto himself had before Freddie Roach. Right? Just compare and contrast the Cotto against Austin Trout, a fight you need to remember, with the Cotto against Sergio Martinez. Right, Cotto's able to dance around the ring. He's able to land huge left shots. He's able to lead with power shots. He returns to his roots, which are the left hand to the body. Right, it's a masterful performance. Here's why I feel he's going to have problems with Gil. Right, when Cotto's in against master boxers who don't have bad knees... Right? Think Austin Trout. Think Joshua Clotty. Think Zab Judah. The fight's a lot closer, isn't it? He loses the Austin Trout fight, and Austin Trout hardly ever goes to his body. Austin Trout's controlling him with the jab. Pay attention to the reaches here. Cotto's reach is 67. Right? Gil, the bigger man, has a 71-inch reach. What happens if Gil starts peppering him from the outside with jabs? Right? If they both throw a jab, I'm telling you, there's a distance at which only Gil's jab will land. I'll say in the Clotty fight, and I encourage people to revisit that fight, you get to the later rounds of that fight, and Cotto is desperate, right? He had a problem boxing with Clotty. Never did give Clotty a rematch, right? Clotty is landing a pretty good jab on Miguel Cotto, right? Clotty's able to cover up when Cotto comes inside. Clotty seems to realize that Cotto is left-handed, that that lead jab, is actually Cotto's power hand. Right? Let's talk about the Zab Judah fight. I want people to go back to that fight. That was a big Cotto coming out party. Right? Cotto famously stops Judah. Here's my million dollar question. Doesn't that fight look a little bit like Felix Trinidad? against Fernando Vargas. As you look at the film of that fight, are you certain that Cotto wins that fight without low blows? Right? Keep in mind, too, Zab Judah quick-handed. Not great foot speed. He can't match Daniel Gill's foot speed when Gill gets going. Right? Understand, too, Zab Judah, Southpaw, right? Like Sergio Martinez, things line up a little bit differently than they'll line up with Daniel Gill. But I'll tell you what, if you go back and if you look at that Cotto Judah fight, you're going to see Judah having success. You're going to see low blows from Cotto at opportune moments to slow Judah down. Right now, all I'm saying is this. Cotto's a smaller man against Daniel Gill. Daniel Gill throws punches in bunches. Right? He's a guy who lets his hands go at times. 
right? He's going to be throwing punches from all kind of angles, right? He's the kind of guy whose movement is unpredictable. In other words, he's not going to be going straight back, right? As I said before, you're not going to know whether he's front foot or back foot at times. Let's talk about Kodo's jab. It's a pretty good jab. Isn't Felix Sturm's jab pretty good? Wasn't Sebastian Sylvester's jab pretty good? Didn't Daniel Gill already beat both men? Right? Who's had more of a problem with a jab? Gill or Miguel Cotto? Right? So, I know the world is going to be bullish on Cotto because that's what happens when a guy wins a title in decisive fashion, right? Like Cotto won his title over Sergio Martinez, right? That's what happens when a guy wins a title over really one of the middleweight division's better champions. My point to you, though, is to Sergio Martinez, who wins the first 11 rounds against Julio Cesar Chavez, would have beaten the Sergio Martinez, who was in the ring with Cotto that night. Keep in mind, Martinez's knee injury is so severe, he hasn't been in the ring since, right? He's supposed to announce whether he's even going to continue his career. That's how bad the knee injury is. Daniel Gill doesn't have a knee injury, right? He's a bigger man who has fought the much better competition at middleweight. Understand, Cotto's fight against Austin Trout, that's not a middleweight fight. His fight against Floyd Mayweather, that's not a middleweight fight. His fight against Joshua Clotty, that's not a middleweight fight. His fight against Yuri Foreman, that's not a middleweight fight. Right? In boxing, there's an adage. A good big man beats a good little man. In the comment section to this video, tell me why that's not gonna happen here right Cotto's a great fighter he's certainly a Hall of Famer but wow does he know his way around the neighborhood called the middleweight division right I believe Cotto would have a better chance against let's say Gennady Golovkin who I haven't really seen deal with an inside fighter who fought a guy uh, Kasim Oma, who came in low inside and who gave him problems. I think Cotto would have a better time, an easier time, against him than this guy. Right? Daniel Gill's going to be a ghost, folks. Right? He's going to be hovering. He's going to be there, but he's not going to be there. Right? Cotto's going to be moving around. He's going to find that this guy isn't stationary like Sergio Martinez was at times in their fight, right? He's going to find that this guy is mentally tough. This guy traveled to Germany for multiple fights against the house fighter. Sebastian Sylvester, very popular in Germany. Felix Sturm, very popular in Germany, right? This is a guy who is mentally tough. Let me say this. The public remembers the car crash that was Gill's loss to Gennady Golovkin. Let's be real here. Wasn't that the worst night of Daniel Gill's professional career? Right? That's like me going to a basketball game and seeing Chris Paul, let's say, have a lot of turnovers or seeing LeBron miss a lot of shots. Right? You know what? If it's the worst night of his career, maybe the guy does better the next time out. So, I think Daniel Gill's a live underdog. I think the Miguel Cotto brand, and he is deservedly a first ballot Hall of Famer, at least in my eyes. But I think the brand is a little bit too overpowering right now. Right? Boxing has weight classes for a reason. Right? We haven't seen Kodo against a healthy world-class middleweight. Right? And this guy is a guy who, quite frankly, has fought 
better middleweights than Cotto. Right? I want people to research the background of Anthony Mundine. Right? I believe Felix Sturm is a Hall of Famer. Right? Those are the kind of guys who Daniel Gill has fought and has beaten. Even the Golovkin fight. Gill, after enduring a four-minute round, right, on his heels with Golovkin stalking him, Daniel Gill lands a pretty good counter right before he gets taken out. He's very good in the pocket. He's very good under pressure. If you look at the Jared Fletcher fight, you're going to see that he's bounced back somewhat from that Janady Golovkin fight. And here, he's fighting an opponent who doesn't have a lethal right hand like Golovkin does. I like Daniel Gill to win this fight. I'll hedge the play with Cotto by KO, right? I believe Gill is going to be a big underdog with the sports books. He shouldn't be. Let's remember, this is a former middleweight champion. Let's remember, right, the guys he's lost to. Let's name all three. Anthony Mundane, a loss he avenged. Excellent fighter. Right? Darren Barker in a fight that could have gone either way. Right? I don't know how a champ loses his belt in a close fight where he gets the one knockdown in the fight. Right? Then, of course, you have the car crash, the Janady Golovkin fight. Those are three damn good fighters. Right? Understand, Gill has only been stopped once in his career. That's the Golovkin fight. Now, since that's the fight everyone in the public remembers, I believe when the odds are released for this fight, Gill's going to be undervalued. I believe you're going to get better than even money odds on Gill simply to win. I like Daniel Gill simply to win. I'm not shaken by the fact that the fight's going to be in New York where Miguel Cotto is popular because Daniel Gill's already beaten Felix Sturm in Germany. Daniel Gill already took a title from Sebastian Sylvester in Germany. He's already traveled to fight well-liked fighters in their backyards. So I like Gill here, hedged with Cotto by KO, Right? Even I know Cotto's left hand is lethal. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here in the comment section to this video. Let's discuss it. I really believe Cotto would have had an easier time, <laughs> quite frankly, against Golovkin. Less risk, Cotto would have been the underdog. I really believe Cotto might even have had an easier time against some other fighters at 160. Someone got cute here and decided to pick a guy they thought was in decline and tried to put a catch weight on it of 157. Right? I think there's enough time for Daniel Gill to be able to at least make 157 for the weigh-in, although the catch weight's unfortunate. I certainly believe that Daniel Gill has a lot left in the tank. We know that just from the Fletcher fight. Hope you give it a look. Hope you leave your comments here in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.